Good afternoon and uh, welcome to those who are joining us from other time zones. Good morning or good evening. My name is Lynn Schofield Park and I am a professor and chair of the Department of Media, Film and Journalism Studies at the University of Denver. And I'm also director of the Edward W. and Charlotte I. Eslow International Center for Journalism and New Media. Um, I'm glad to welcome you to today's master class on media and politics with former Congresswoman and Colorado's first female elected to the House of Representatives, Pat Schroeder. Let's begin this afternoon with acknowledging the land on which the University of Denver sits, which is the land of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute tribes, whose descendants still live in the area. As noted in the University of Denver's John Evans study report of 2016, the institutional history of the university is linked with the Sand Creek Massacre. And that event took place in the same year, 1864, that the university was founded. So the mission of the university therefore calls on us to ensure that Native American students, staff, alumni, and communities can benefit from the education and programs and research that the university offers. I'm looking to see if uh, Chancellor Hefner is with us, it looks like. So I'm going to be pleased to introduce you to uh, the University of Denver's 19th Chancellor, Ter Jeremy Hefner, who has reaffirmed the university's commitment to acknowledging its history and who includes among the five strategic imperatives for the university, the importance of cultivating an exceptionally diverse, inclusive, equitable and welcoming community. Chancellor Hefner joined the University of Denver as provost and executive vice chancellor and then was named chancellor by the university's board of trustees in 2019. Chancellor Hefner came to the University of Denver after serving as provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Rochester Institute of Technology and prior to that as dean of engineering and applied sciences as well as other leadership positions he held at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Chancellor Hefner has held, he's a mathematician who studies integral representation and module theory. And uh, he has also held fellowships with the American Council on Education, the National Infrastructure Institute and the University of Murcia in Spain. Thanks for being with us, Chancellor Hefner, to welcome former Representative Schroeder to our campus virtually. Well, thank you, Lynn. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and allowing me to come in on really a, a, a terrific event. It's an honor to be here this afternoon to celebrate democracy together and to hear from Representative Schroeder on uh, who was an inspiring Colorado trailblazer and champion of democracy. When I was in Colorado, uh, down in Colorado Springs, uh, Representative Schroeder was an icon for me. Uh, so it's an absolute delight to welcome her and congratulate her on this really wonderful award that uh, we are uh, bestowing on her today. I, I love the idea of an Anvil of Freedom Award, and I could think of no one better uh, than Representative Schroeder. You know, it's her life and career that uh, represents in so many ways what we want every single University of Denver student to have, a life of purpose, a meaningful career, an unwavering commitment to serving the public good, resiliency in the face of challenge and a vision for a better world. All of those uh, really are part of Representative Schroeder's uh, uh, wonderful career and life. Uh, we provide students with the education and support and experiences that they need to really pursue these lofty ambitions for themselves. And I think we have aspirations and plans to, to do even more in supporting our students to achieve them. Uh, we are dedicated to uh, learning and educating our students with the programming that we provide to really serve them holistically, to, to really make sure that we're developing the entire person. Uh, this is important because the world has grown to be a very complicated one. And this notion that they need not only great intellectual and academic skills, but a vast array of life skills in order to navigate this very complex world. And many of you know that we have uh, dedicated ourselves to this holistic experience by being very intentional with uh, an initiative that we call the four-dimensional experience. It's in its pilot phase. Uh, we welcomed 142 very brave first-year students to uh, undergo the, the initial programming that we've put together. And I will say that um, it's been 
a very good success for us. And we've learned a lot uh, along the way. The four-dimensional students are uh, going to explore character. Uh, they're going to have a deeper understanding of themselves and especially working with others, others that are different from them. And I can't tell you how important that is um, because it brings in responsibility and integrity and ethics and resiliency. They're certainly advancing their intellectual growth and that's the second dimension. Uh, we here at the University of Denver are known for our small student to faculty ratio, but even more importantly, the relationships that faculty build with students and students with faculty is uh, a shining beacon for the university, uh, one that I take great pride in because it undergirds that our faculty are teacher scholars here. The third dimension that students are um, currently exploring and, and doing more work in is pursuing careers and these lives of purpose. Uh, we know that in order for them to reach their highest potential, they have to develop certain skills like self-awareness, like building uh, connections and networking and really have effective communication. We have a very unique four-year program for undergraduates, two-year program for graduates uh, that help them develop these career skills that they're going to need. And I have no doubt that Representative Schroeder has, uh, and like so many influential leaders, developed similar skills to support their work. And then finally, one that is so important in uh, today's environment where we are battling, continue to battle a, a very devastating pandemic, and that is to promote the well being of each other, of, of the self. And we know the well being touches on uh, emotional, physical, social, uh, financial, spiritual. All those aspects are so important. And we want, especially, every student to graduate with a deep understanding of how those spheres of well being intersect and how they can really develop skills and tools to really manage their well-being in the future. All of this is made possible by a DU community, faculty and staff that are truly committed to our students, truly committed to the public good and truly committed to advancing knowledge. I am so proud of our faculty for the diverse ways that they bring ethics into the classroom and that they challenge our students with engaging them on very complicated issues. I'm also very deeply proud of the staff, whether they uh, work on, on the campus grounds to make it uh, as beautiful and inviting as possible, or they work to support our students outside the classroom, but they're, they're doing their part to really undergird the mission of this university. I want to thank the um, Eslo family. I am so grateful that so many of you could join us today. Uh, I want to thank the Colorado Sun for their continued partnership. Uh, we've enjoyed that over the years. And then finally, a deep thank you to Representative Schroeder. Uh, we're grateful to welcome you and learn more about you and your incredible career. And now I'd like to invite our esteemed next speaker which is uh, a well-known person in our faculty, the director of our Center of American Politics and professors of political science, Dr. Seth Maskett. Seth. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Um, uh, Dr. Clark, should I go at this time? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Just make sure. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chancellor, for that very kind introduction, for those wonderful remarks. Um, it is my honor this afternoon to uh, introduce our guest speaker and winner of the Eslo Center's 2021 Anvil of Freedom Award. Uh, Pat Schroeder is a path-breaking figure in Colorado politics. She and her husband, Jim, moved to Denver in the 1960s, where uh, she worked for the National Labor Relations Board, um, as well as Planned Parenthood, and she taught in Denver's public school system. In 1972, she took on what was considered a long shot battle to unseat the Republican incumbent in Colorado's first congressional district, uh, Representative Mike McKevitt, uh, running on an anti-war, pro-environment and pro-child care platform uh, before such, stance or, such stances were considered mainstream. Um, she surprised the political establishment by winning, uh, becoming then the youngest woman ever elected to the House and serving in that seat for 24 years. In the House, she became the first woman ever to serve on the Armed Services Committee. She developed a strong reputation for her efforts on work family issues 
and was a successful advocate for the 1985 Military Family Act, as well as the 1993 Family and Medical Leave Act. After departing Congress in 1997, uh, Schroeder became president and CEO of the Association of American Publishers, where she worked for over a decade as a fierce advocate for strong copyright laws to protect writers and publishers. Schroeder now resides in Florida, where she is on the board of the League of Women Voters. We'll hear from uh, Representative Schroeder for around 30 minutes, and then we will turn to the questions and answers portion of today's program. Um, I'm pleased that uh, my class at the University of Denver on parties and interest groups is here with us today, along with many others. Uh, I hope you all please join me in welcoming former Representative Pat Schroeder. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I thank you for all the wonderful introductions and now watch me blow it, right? And then sometimes I think after the introduction, I should just leave. I probably can't meet it. But anyway, I am absolutely delighted to be talking about all of this today um, because I must say, as an 80 year old, I'm, I'm a little worried about both the democracy and journalism. So let me, let me try and explain to you why I, I think we're in a troubling time. First of all, you're right, I am in Florida, which is probably uh, America's insane asylum for politics right now. Some of you have read about Getz and our, and our governor and all sorts of other unbelievable things. But let me go back to journalism. If you go back and look at our history of journalism, um, it got off to a tough start. Um, the first newspaper that I've been able to find out, maybe professors know, more than I do, but looked like it was published in 1670. And guess what? The next day it was shut down. Um, <laughs> my daughter had also done a family search and found out that I'm directly related to, a, to an ancestor that had the first banned book in Boston. So maybe that stayed in the bloodline all the way through and maybe that's what I've been. Um, so, so outward in speaking about so many issues. Um, when you look at our forefathers, our forefathers all realized that journalism was absolutely essential to being able to keep democracy functioning and liberty. Um, Jefferson was so clear that he even said, if you had to choose between liberty or free news and, and government, he would take the news any day. And I think most of them understood the same thing. And that's why I think you see such strong statements um, in our past about freedom of expression and the freedom of speech. Um, when you look at it history-wise, there have been times when we've really not done too well with that. The McCarthy era was one. Um, obviously there was the Alien and Sedition Acts. There were other things that happened, but there were also some very good things that happened. Um, I must say I was very pleased, obviously, I was in Congress when the Pentagon Papers were released, and that was very exciting. And then, of course, to watch the whole thing going on with um, the Nixon impeachment and the importance that the press played there, that was terribly important. So it's absolutely vital, and I think right now, um, the written press is in a lot of trouble. As I say, we live here in Florida where we desperately need more newspapers. And right now the Tribune company, which mainly owns most of the papers down here is thinking about selling it all to you know, powers that be in New York that are just gonna try and run it on the cheap. So that's troubling to me. Marty Baron who a lot of you know, was the editor of the Washington Post and at one time of Boston, um, said, facts and truth are matters of life and death. That disinformation, delusion, and deceit, deceit equal killing you. And we're also seeing that now with the pandemic, when we're seeing people getting information that's just not correct and also not listening to the information that is correct. Somehow science has become a bad word for people. Um, and that's very troubling. So let, let's look at all this and how did I survive in all of this? Well, to be perfectly honest, um, if you go back and look at the history of journalism, um, 
in the beginning, it was the printed press that we all know. And I still love the printed press. I, I realize I can get it digitally, but I want a paper. So I guess I'm a real old fashioned type there. Um, but the people who owned the press owned it and they were allowed to say whatever they wanted, okay? So then that was kind of the media that bubbled along for quite a while in this country. And then suddenly there became a new media and the new media became broadcasting. That was different. What do you do with broadcasting? Well, broadcasting, you needed a, a, to get on, you know, and on the airways. And to get on the airways, there were so many limited airways that you had to get a license. So suddenly for the first time, there was some kind of regulation of, of a media event such as broadcasting. In other words, if you wanted to be a broadcaster, you had to go to the FCC and get a license for um, the, the broadcast channel that you would be on. And every five years or so you had to go renew it. So that was a little different than fully owning the press because there was such a limited number. You could have all the presses you wanted, but you couldn't have all the, of the airways that you wanted. So the thing that probably saved me <laughs> was way back in, in 1949, <laughs> the FCC came up with this idea that since the airways really are public, I mean, the people own the air, um, there should be something called the fairness doctrine and equal time doctrine. And what that meant was if you presented one side, you had to present the other side. Um, and if somebody attacked somebody, they had the right to get on equally and, and respond. So a lot of people say to me, how in the world did you get elected in 1972 as a young mother with a two-year-old and a six-year-old? And my average campaign contribution was $7.50. I mean, you know, that almost sounds like I was back with dinosaurs, right? <laughs> the way I made it was with this wonderful fairness doctrine <laughs> because there was always somebody on there attacking me 24-7. And what I could do is then ask for equal time and say, well, okay. So they said this about me, but let me tell you what I meant or let me tell you where I really am or blah, 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 blah. I mean, there were people saying I was always barefoot. Someone else said that I spent my time going to cancer wards and smoking and blowing smoke in the face <laughs> of dying patients. I mean, it was wonderful. It was wonderful stuff, especially since I'm not even a smoker. You don't know where they got this stuff. But you could go on and say, wait a minute. <laughs> they also even accused my parents of being dairy farmers <laughs> in Wisconsin and that I was a tool of the dairy farms, um, which was hysterical because my parents came out of Nebraska and had never seen a dairy farm in their whole life. So, you know, we were, we were able to kind of straighten all of that out, shall we say, equally and fairly without having to spend a lot of money, <laughs> which is always a problem when you come to media. So um, then what happened? Well, one of the sad things I think that happened both for politics and, and all of us as citizens is that suddenly um, Reagan got elected and we got rid of the whole fairness doctrine. Now, those of us in Congress were upset about it, got together, and wrote another bill saying there should be a fairness doctrine for broadcasting. Now we're talking about broadcasting, not print. Um, and unfortunately, Bush said he was gonna veto it too. It never made the light of day. And then all the people that owned the airways, obviously that owned the stations, wanted no part of this because uh, they didn't wanna have to go through what communities thought of them every five years to renew their broadcasts to say that they really were treating the community fairly. Many um, churches in the South had taken on broadcast licenses because the, they weren't doing much about civil rights during those periods. And you can imagine somebody didn't appreciate ever being challenged. They were sure that they were fine, yada, yada, yada. So we start with that. I mean, that's kind of how I got my start, thank goodness. 
but it disappeared in 1987. And the interesting thing then that happened to politics was 1988. Guess what happened in 1988? Rush Limbaugh was hired to do a radio station <laughs> and talk radio became um, the, the new big thing that was going on in politics. And because he could say anyone and no one could get equal time, um, there you were. He used to call me a feminazi. And I used to have staff working all the time. He called me all sorts of other things besides that. Uh, just trying to see if I could even call into his talk radio show. They would never take the call. Then I tried to buy time. I thought, well, I'll buy an ad. And you couldn't buy an ad either. He was allowed to say whatever he wanted. And nobody ever had to listen to the other side at all. So maybe some of you think that's great. I didn't. I really think that it's so important to hear both sides because there are and sometimes more than both sides, but there are different sides and different ways to look at anything. So that became a whole new piece. Then another whole new piece was the Supreme Court deciding that corporations were people. And so they could give all the money they wanted and that the dark money um, could come into these campaigns where we don't even know who's giving the dark money. So suddenly you have a tremendous, a tremendous cost for running for Congress. Nobody's running with $7.50 as their average campaign contribution anymore. And in fact, I would be naughty enough to say that I don't think there's anybody in politics that's worth what it costs to elect them every year. Now, they probably would disagree, but nevertheless. And in the interim, Lobbyists have become a really big thing because they can give a lot of this big money. It used to be lobbyists were people who cared about certain issues and came in and talked to you, but now it's like they buy the money. I remember when certain committees would meet that would cover a certain area, such as, let's say, Ways and Means, which covers taxation, and everybody wants lower taxes for themselves. And they would get together at the beginning of the year and assign nights for each of their fundraisers so that they weren't having to compete. And it's really the same group of people, same group of lobbyists going to each of the fundraisers, but it was how they raised their money. And sadly enough, um, how we got a messed up coat when I was in Congress, <laughs> when I was in law school, I'm sorry. The tax code was like this. And now it's volumes. <laughs> I mean, we've got little special things for all sorts of special people all the way. So that's, that's all very sad to me. And these are things that scare me a lot. And then when you put that together with the cutbacks in journalism, um, where I really think we desperately need journalists out there telling people what's going on and what the government is doing and what's really happening. Um, that one of the things that I read last week that just scared me to death is that three fourths of Americans don't know what the three branches of government are. Now think about that. You don't even know what the three branches of government are? Well, that's what the survey said. So something is, is missing in there. They may know the Kardashians, you know, people may know all their names, but they don't know that. Then there's the voting issues too, that we desperately need to know more about. Um, I think all of you have heard about the Electoral College and how um, we've had presidents over and over again recently that have not gotten the popular vote most people think in a democracy, it's the popular vote. They think it's the electoral college instead that made them president. So if you look at it and you look at the fact that Alaska, Montana, North and South Dakota, Wyoming, it's 10 states or five states, I'm sorry, that has 10 senators and their total population does not equal Metro San Francisco. And Metro San Francisco has 
a small percentage that they have to share with other people in California of two senators. They've got 10 senators versus a small. And so this is the kind of stuff that's, that, that's kind of gotten out of balance um, since the constitution was written. And I think there's some serious issues there that we really, really have to think about and think about much deeper. And then of course, there's the filibuster. Now, look, I'm so old that when I went to Congress, the filibuster meant you know, really had to get up and do the thing. They'd bring in cots, and they'd bring in coffee machines, and they'd bring in water. And I mean, they all hung out for the night and went on and on and on. If you wanted to stop it, you had to keep talking or have other friends to join you and you had to stay there and stay there. And then they made it really easy. All you had to do was raise your hand and say, I think I'm gonna filibuster that. And so they back off and say, well, are there 60 votes? And then, no, there's not 60 votes. Okay, that's it, we killed it. Now that to me does not seem very fair either. When especially you look at how the Senate, um, so many uh, senators represent fewer people than, than like maybe four senators from two states. So it, how does that work out to be fair? Maybe fair isn't what they're interested in, but uh, no, I, I think they, uh, very minimum ought to have to go back and work for a filibuster if they want to. I think one of the problems is it's become more and more like a, an old age rest home and they don't want to have to work that hard. So they'll just you know give it up and walk out and that, that scares me. So we also see all the issues going on with voting rights and with uh, redrawing um, different districts deciding that people can vote by mail or can't vote by mail. Now, here's an interesting tidbit that I doubt that you in Colorado know. We just went through this horrific trial in Minnesota. And it, you know, this gentleman that got all three charges filed against him and was a police officer in Minneapolis, said he was a resident of Florida. He votes in Florida. He has a condo 10 miles from my house. Why does he do that? Because Florida doesn't have state taxes. So he plays like he lives here by voting by mail. So we have all sorts of these kind of folks pretending that they live here, which creates a real problem for us. But when you're trying to poll people or when you're trying to organize or anything else because they're not even here. But there's so many games like that, that that was not even discovered in Minneapolis until this whole thing happened. If we, we had a more vibrant press, they probably would have found maybe other people who said they were working for the city or the state or whatever it was, but were also claiming to be residents of some other state where they get better tax deals or playing some kind of game. And, and I don't know about you, but I have no patience with that kind of game playing. I just, it, it really distresses me and makes me worry about where we're going and, and what's going to happen long term. So there we go. <laughs> and now what has happened and where are we? Well, I look at our government and I look at freedom and it seems to me the new political tactic so often that kind of works is the number one stall. Stall as long as you can because you think people are going to forget it. If they don't forget it, then you kind of obfuscate, you know, trying to, well, what about, the what about isms are wonderful, you know. What about the fact that, you know, fill in the blank. The other thing is to attack your opponent, okay? You decide, I'll decide, you come at me and ask me about a thing and I'll say, you know, this other guy, let me tell you how bad he is. And if that doesn't work, you start and do it all over again. You stall a long time and then you obfuscate a long time and then you attack and then you repeat it again until people get worn out. I think there's another thing that's going on that we've really lost leadership and it's become 
showmanship more than leadership. It's like who entertains us. Um, and it's really not about being entertaining. I mean, I don't, Lincoln, yes, was entertaining. He told great stories, but he also showed a lot of leadership. So I think we have to put that into the mix. Now, one of the other Floridians that you may have read about recently, who's been in the news, is Representative Gates. He has been in the legislature and Congress, I'm sorry, for four years, four years. He's been on Fox News over 170 times. He's not had one bill passed. And the main bill he introduced was the change in the name of a post office in his district, but he hasn't even been able to get that passed. He brags about the fact he doesn't have any legislative staff because he thinks legislation is pfft. what's important is to be out there and to be on TV and to be, you know, doing all these things. And I think I'm not so sure the forefathers would agree with him. I think they had different ideas for what people were supposed to do in Congress. So, you know, I, <laughs> all I can say is, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I don't think evolution is working <laughs> in the political class. So I am so hoping that there are young people there that can pick this thing up and get back to evolution in the political class because it's to me it's very frustrating and scary and scary as to where we're going to go. I look here and again let me look at where I live now. One of the things that bugged me is nobody knows how anybody votes in Florida. They all go to Tallahassee which could be out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean Tallahassee's and if you look at a lot of states, their states are the same way. Their state capitals are way far away. Luckily in Colorado, you guys are in Denver where there are people, you know. But Tallahassee, no. I mean, it's, it's a day's drive from Miami. It's a day and a half from the Keys. And for me, it's like six hours. So who goes there? It's, it's nothing. As a consequence, no one knows how anybody votes up there. They get away with all sorts of stuff up there. And the lobbyists control, totally. I mean, the lobbyists are the ones that are there 24 seven, the big high rolling lobbyists. So I had gone to my newspaper editor down here, which was the Orlando Sentinel. And I said, I really think if you did one thing, it could make a big difference. And that is print how the members from this central Florida area voted. Imagine what a radical thing, but just print how they voted. You don't have to do anything else. Print how they voted and let people know. And the same with the congressional and the Senate delegation. Well, the editor thought it was a great idea. And the next week the editor was fired. So <laughs> We still don't have any information about how they voted unless you want to spend a tremendous amount of time going through all this stuff um, in Tallahassee and trying to figure it out. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's really, it really scares me when I think that um, it, how important it is that people know how, how people are voting that they vote for. If you don't know how they voted, how do you know who to vote for? It doesn't make sense. But anyway, let me, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> my, um, my experience in politics was I told you about getting in. And I was in there for very tough times. When I first came in in 1972, we had the Vietnam War going on. And when I went to the Nixon swearing in, there were National Guardsmen sleeping in all the tunnels. Uh, there were all the anti-war demonstrations going on. It was very, very tough. And then we also started with impeachment. I mean, here was a gentleman, I mean, Nixon had won 49 states, 49. And suddenly these two young journalists in the middle from Washington Post started discovering all the stuff that was going on with Watergate. So it was, it was quite an emotional time. And of course there were many other issues at the same time, but nevertheless, 
the way we approached our job is entirely different than they do now. I could debate somebody on the war who was very different in my feelings about the war. I was like, well, we ought to come home. But they could say, no, why they should stay. And then we could go to lunch together, you know, and talk about other issues or why we saw things differently and on and on. Or they may be with me on the issues in South Africa, but against um, what I was thinking about in, in, in something else, impeachment or something else. And, you know, you just, that's how I think it should be. <laughs> it's kind of like, I guess, growing up as a lawyer, you would go in and you would argue your case, but that didn't mean that you weren't friends with the other lawyers. Uh, you didn't just say, I never want to talk to you again because you were on the other side. You suddenly wouldn't be able to talk to any lawyers in your whole town. So yeah, no, we, we all recognized we had different views and that we should all listen. So we did. And then in 1994, Gingrich became the speaker and he changed the whole thing. He, was, he would have people come in and speak to the Republican caucus. And it was like, no, this is what you do. You don't answer on the issue, you would tackle. And in fact, one of the favorite things that my children love is there's some, like, something on the internet somewhere where they keep filming me saying, uh, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker, do I have to call the gentleman a gentleman if he's not being a, a gentleman? But Because that's usually after they call me a communist and socialist and a, every other such thing. You can think a snake, <laughs> it's called some lovely thing. So rather than come back on the issue or why they thought that I was wrong, they come back and say, no, you're, you're really a terrible person. Um, it's the dance of rage. We can't let people like you, you're a witch, uh, the witch from the West or whatever, the, the wicked witch of the West as it's often called. Um, and so after about two years, oh, well, actually, actually about one year of that, I came home and I said to my husband, you know, I feel like I'm in a junior high lunchroom having a food fight every single day. We're getting nothing done. And if you really enjoy standing down there and shouting and yelling and hollering at everybody, then oh, this, this is great. But I didn't enjoy that. I like to get things done. Thank you. And so I decided I would retire because I had had enough of that. And I went to Princeton and taught at the Woodrow Wilson School for a while. Uh, the young people trying to talk them into going into politics. Now listen to this, you that are going into politics. I walked into my class the first day and I said, I'm so excited to be here. This is wonderful. How many of you were thinking for running for office? Not a hand went up. And I said, am I in the wrong class? And they said, no, no, you're in the right class. It's that we all wanna be behind the scenes. And I'm like, no, you cannot be behind the scenes. You have to get out there and fight for what's right. This is crazy. So it was, it was an interesting experience that I had with these young people. And then the next thing I did was I became a chairman of the Book of Publishers Association. All the book publishers in, the, in America uh, were part of this group. And this is where I met another new media. And this new media you're all familiar with, it's all the online stuff. And this is how I made all my students at Princeton mad at me, and probably all of you too, but I need to talk to you about all of this. Um, <laughs> we suddenly had a message from Amazon that they had this great idea that they were gonna sell every book for the same price, $5. We said, you can't sell every book for $5. It's absolutely impossible. I mean, they, oh no, this would be great for them, they said, because it'd be so much easier if they sold them all for $5. Okay. So we had that little thing going on with some of our new media people. And then suddenly Google came up with this great idea that they were gonna digitize every book in the libraries around America and give them out free. 
And we were like, no, no, you can't do that either because how do the people who make the books make a living if no one ever has to sell but one book to one library and then that's digital and it's out there for everyone and isn't that terrific? So we had this giant lawsuit going against everybody. Obviously, Amazon backed away. And one of the interesting things that probably you don't even know is Amazon still will not sell a book to a library because they don't want to sell one book. They want to sell a lot of books. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but they obviously do have different prices on books. The Google thing, obviously, they backed off too. When we convinced them that you can digitize all you want when you come to anything that's out of copyright. But if it's not out of copyright, you can't digitize it. It is owned by the owner and you have to deal with it. Um, they did not like that at all. It's a very costly, costly lawsuit. I must say I was terribly disappointed in the Newspaper Association because we couldn't get them to join us and we couldn't get the Magazine Association to join us. Um, they kept saying, oh, it's so wonderful. People can read our stuff in Bangladesh. And I kept saying, yeah, that's terrific. But how do you get paid? Um, when we lived in Washington, we lived in an area with a whole lot of young people um, that all worked in government, all had to read newspapers, all had to look at the Washington Post every day, clearly. And none of them subscribed to it. They took it all online. Um, so here you go, the Washington Post pays to get it all done. They take it free. <laughs> and then what they do is, is they sell ads around it. Well, isn't that wonderful? They sell ads around it and they make the money. And meanwhile, I don't know how you pay your people. So they're starting to try and work that through, but it's, it's really been devastating, I think to news, to, to journalism, to all sorts of things. Um, it, it, it's gonna be a real challenge. Now, one of the things that I'm very excited about, Australia has now come out with legislation saying both Google and Facebook must pay newspapers for content. So, they have to pay for the people who went out and found the news that they are now copying and selling ads all around. Um, no other countries followed that, but anybody who's interested might look at the legislation in, in Australia, which I cheer loudly. I have relatives in Australia and I'm like, you guys, you go. <laughs> it's, it's great. That's how I lost all my friends at Princeton though. All, all the students said, we want our books free. What is the matter with you? How could you do that to us? And I kept saying to them, pick up your constitution, please, and read article one, section eight, clause eight. It says to promote the progress of science and useful arts, authors and inventors have a limited time of exclusive rights over their writing and their their uh, discoveries. And then I say, please read that. It was so important to our founders that it's not an addition to the constitution, it's article one in the body because they understood how important that was. And then I would say to my, my students, now tell me, what is it you wanna go into? Are you gonna make shoes or what do you, oh no, no, we're not gonna do that. So, then I'd say, well, okay, you're gonna need, <laughs> you're gonna need this protection for most of the stuff that you're doing. 99% of you are gonna be doing something that's intellectual property. And if they can give it all away, then you're really in trouble. So it's, it's been an interesting time to try and navigate through all these different things <laughs> and, and try and, um, deal with all these different new media types and where we go and what we do. But the main problem is you need the person on the ground that's finding out what's really happening so they can educate the person that's supposedly part of the public 
who's going to have to vote and make decisions on what these people are doing that call themselves leaders. Um, we, we say we're governed by reason and truth. And I must say of late, I think there's been a lot of truth decay. Yes, truth decay, because less and less do we see government working. Um, it, it's just showboating or, you know, we used to say there were showboats, and there were show horses and workhorses. Um, and, and we just desperately need journalists examining what happens to the government. And, and then that way, I think the government benefits because people can make a they can make some kind of a reasoned decision, hopefully, rather than just, well, who's the cutest or who would I rather have a beer with or yada, yada, yada. So um, I could go on for five, <laughs> five hours. I open the refrigerator and the light goes on and I talk for five minutes before I realize I'm talking to celery. Um, I, I have so many ideas and so many things but I'd much rather open it up and see what kind of questions people have here. So thank you very much. And thank you. I forgot to thank Dr. Clark and Chancellor Hefner and, 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 and Seath Maskett for their very nice words beforehand. So thank you and let's see what, where we go. Well, thank you so much, Representative Schroeder. It's really been wonderful to be able to hear from you. And we're very happy that you're able to talk with us instead of Celery today. So we really appreciate being able to, to be an audience for you. And we do have several students who have put some questions into the chat for you. And so we wanted to prioritize those. And we also want to encourage anyone else who has questions for Representative Schroeder, please put them in the Q&A section. And I'm going to turn over the first question to Larry Rickman to ask. He's the editor of the Colorado Sun. And he's going to ask one of the questions that came up from one of our journalism students. So Representative Schroeder, thank you so much for, for talking about uh, the real, really the crisis in, in the news industry. I mean, we've lost newspapers all across the country. There are entire counties that have no newspaper. Um, the newspapers that have survived uh, are in many cases a shadow of themselves. I mean, there's a, a, a huge crisis. The question is, and, and I'm wondering if and a student is asking, and I'm also wondering, what what solutions do you have? There's there's been some discussion about, uh, you know, maybe it's time to talk about government funding uh, for uh, for media, along the same lines as the you know Corporation for Public Broadcasting, you know, gets uh, government support. Um, what are what are your thoughts about that? Is that is that a slippery slope? I mean, for myself, 20 years ago, I would have said, no way, you're crazy. You know, you got to have a, a firm wall between government and media. Today, I'm not so sure. And I, I know I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think I would align with you. I would have definitely said no before. Um, I, I do think we should look more at this Australia law. Mm -hmm. um, this Australia law, I think, should become a model. And we should be looking for uh, legislators. It should be a very key thing, um, part of our government because they're making so much money off of journalists now. It's unbelievable. Uh, and we all know how much money Amazon and, <laughs> and Facebook and, and all of them are, are making, putting it out there. And that's where people are getting their news. And yet the people who just put this news together, the people who go out in their, you know, with their shoe leather and gather it all and write it all up and all of that, they're getting zip, absolutely zip out of that. And, and so I do think that's another alternative too. So I would definitely look, I'm saying yay Australia for, for leading the way because to me, that's, that's part of it too. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, let's turn it over to uh, Professor Maska. He had a couple of students who had raised some questions for you in the chat as well. Hi. Thanks so much. Yes, I had a few a uh, few students who'd written in. Um, one is uh, uh, Isla Later writing, who is a Florida resident, uh, who says she's uh, curious about your thoughts surrounding former data scientist Rebecca Jones and the seizure of her electronic devices after she was uh, critical of Florida's COVID nineteen response. Um, uh, if you're familiar with that, I'd be curious to know your, your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I'm very, I was very upset about that too. And again, thank goodness for the press because they, they exposed it. Um, here's this woman who's saying that the stuff we're putting out is garbage, you know? <laughs> and, and her job is to put it out, but somebody's censoring it. And what do they do? They come and take her, they, they come to her house like, I think it was even a no-knock warrant. I can't remember if they knocked or not. But anyway, she wakes up, her kids are there having breakfast and they're coming roaring in to grab everything that they've got. And one of the later things that your, your student may not know that was in the paper just today, um, 60 Minutes did a whole piece on the governor and how he's treated COVID. And he was the one, obviously, who dealt with Rebecca Jones and so forth. But the, the thing was, is that people were giving him money, big, in, like the public supermarket, which would have been the King Supers equivalent down here, gave him $100,000. And he made them the exclusive um, shot provider for a while. And then suddenly shots showed up in the wealthiest parts of Florida <laughs> when they weren't in other places. Now, no, so, so 60 Minutes nailed him. I mean, they really did it, if anybody watched 60 Minutes. And he has been crying like a baby. Oh, this is just terrible. I can't believe this is so awful. It's all wrong, none of that happened. So today in the, in the uh, Orlando Sentinel, yay paper, they said, let us tell you something. We have been trying to get the records from the governor about this paying and, and uh, you know. They, first of all, they said, you'll have to pay to get those records. So they paid the money and they still don't have the records two or three months later. So they said, we are totally done with the governor whining about how 60 minutes lied because no one here has been able to see the real records. So that kind of is in the Rebecca Jones area Again, whoever is controlling the records of his $8 million that he collected, um, and then who was told to send COVID cases where, or COVID shots where, as a, you, know, you see what kind of money's coming in, and then that's, you decide that's where the shots are gonna go. Um, no one's been able to see the paper work on it, so yeah. Thank you for that question, because that was that was today's paper, which was just amazing. Um, another question, actually, sort of a combination from a few students, is you've, you've described a number of very significant concerns you have with, with the American political system, uh, with, with the state of journalism, and we're just sort of, uh, some, some people are curious, like, are there things that you find that make you optimistic, that give you hope in our system, that you think are moving in the right direction? Well, of course, this is such an interesting week to be having this discussion. Um, Minnesota. <laughs> I, you know, as a lawyer, I was very nervous as to what was going to happen there. I think that was a real breakthrough. Um, and I'm hoping it gets us some momentum. The other thing is, of course, guns. At what we watched down here when the school was hit, obviously, and all those young people. And they give me hope. Those young people just don't give up. I mean, they're back out um, every day trying to get, I mean, there's a bill now in the legislature that you can take, that, that they passed, I think, that you can take a loaded gun to church with you. Um, you, you know, how nutty can it get? Um, so I, I do see young people really grasping a hold of this. I've seen women uh, kind of rising up. I thought the women's marches that were going on were very interesting. And I've seen women here uh, decide they're just gonna organize their area. Uh, my area had never voted blue and it did vote blue this time because women got organized and they literally, even though it was COVID, went door to door and said, listen, let me tell you, A, B, C, D. <laughs> now, those kind of things would be happening normally in a paper, or so, but it's so hard to get it now or to get people to find out about it. So I think there's that kind of positive thing. And, and I do think the media has been good for allowing people to help organize um, and, and find things. But, but 
you know, the other thing is, is the misinformation. We had a lot of the Russian misinformation come down here. And I was teaching for a while at Ramos College. And we had done a great, um, we had done a terrific registration drive at Rollins College. And then I looked and they didn't vote. And I went and I said, wait a minute, you guys, how come you didn't vote? I mean, you registered. And they said, no, 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 we voted, we voted online. And I said, were you in space? Because outside of people who are in space, I don't know anybody that can vote online. Um, and they said, no, they said on, on, you know, we got media saying we can, so I think that was part of the, if you remember, they said several counties in Florida, we had Russian interference in that kind of thing too. But again, it's, it's getting the real information out to people and information they can trust. Thank, thank you for that, um, Representative. I'm gonna uh, pose a question here from uh, one of my esteemed colleagues in the journalism program, uh, Margie Thompson, who, um, has been with us for a very long time, and we are very uh, thankful for her service and her focus on multicultural journalism has been really um, a, a big part of our department. And Margie, thank you for the question, and it's nice to see you here. But Margie's question is, what advice would you have for students to deal with the problems in congressional politics and also journalism? So it's a two-part question. So that's the first part. How do you, um, what advice do you have for students to deal with the problem in congressional politics? You sort of illustrated some of those examples. So part one. Part two is, are there any journalism and new media trends that you've talked about? How can they change things using those tools? So how do you deal with Congress these days? And then how do you embrace technology to, to do the best job that they can do and work with people you know, like yourself in seats of power? Well, one of the things, <laughs> I, I can tell you some of the things that I did, and I still think that they work, unfortunately. The gentleman I ran against had very high approval ratings, and, and it was the year that Nixon ran and carried all 49 states, including my district. So how did I win? Well, the first thing was um, I had been very worried about the war, and I had tried to go see him multiple times about the war. He was always too busy. And, you know, I try and bring other friends. I'd say, well, no, there's 20 of us. We'd like to come talk about the war, you know? No, it's too busy. But he would send us newsletters and he sent us agricultural yearbooks. And he's not. So I did all this stuff about, has anybody seen him? Has he, has he been here? I've been trying to see him over and over. And, and, you know, I can't get an appointment. Has anybody else been able to, you know, you, you kind of do, uh, don't forget to go see your representative in the district. You don't have to go to DC. DC is the worst because you're probably not going to see him. You're going to see some staff. See him in the district. And if you can't see him in the district, remind people. In fact, there, there were some Congress people that won and some young ones after I got elected that I loved it in 1990. 1974 they ran pictures saying has anyone seen this man <laughs> he says he represents you but <laughs> we have not found it so you know i i think there's a lot of things like that i think the other thing is if you find out the other thing we did a lot was we found out 10 things that he voted against that we knew dendrites were for and we made them into door hangers, you know. And did you know your, your congressman voted against A, B, C, D, E, you know? And I think that that brought it home to people. Um, and then you always hope that I was taller than the gentleman and he used to call me little Patsy, and, and, which I just thought was wonderful because everybody kind of went, what is he doing? So, yeah, I mean, look at it it's all politics is local as they say so it's very hard to say exactly what you do but i do think um going to see them um asking for voting records on certain things and asking you for positions on certain things is terribly important that's what they're supposed to be doing and if you can take a group of friends with you because they're much more apt to to let you in if you have 10 rather than just yourself um, so that, that's what I do. <laughs> Real quick, um, speaking of tools, and Larry, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, cut you off before you even started talking. Um, but you were saying also, uh, 
I know that in your career, you actually filed a FOIA request, and this is like a core journalism tool, and it's part of obviously our open records, etc. Um, what brought you to want to file a FOIA request? Because that's something like that Larry and his team might be doing to get data about people. What brought you to want to actually use like a your own reporting to understand something that you felt was being undisclosed? Well, <laughs> it's it's rather personal in that you're so you're, you're too young to remember J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover was totally convinced, I guess, I mean, I, I never met the man, but I guess he thought that people like me were a challenge to the entire Congress, to the whole universe. And we started having people breaking into our house and nothing would be missing. Well, actually, what was missing, they could have walked into our campaign thing and we're going to hand it to them. Um, and then I found people breaking into my car. And I finally saying to people, look, put on gloves because you don't have fingerprints anywhere and look what you're doing. And we thought they were trying to plant drugs in it. They were trying to plant drugs in the um, uh, car somewhere. Um, and, and then we had strange things like Jim's barber would show up every night uh, or uh, several different nights every week about dinner time and want to come in and chat. <laughs> anyway, so one day um, during the impeachment thing, one of my staffers was at actually DU speaking to a bunch of students about how impeachment was going. And he said there were strange guys standing in the back of the room. And I finally thought, you know what? I'm just going to do a FOIA request. So I did. And it turned out, well, I'll tell you the next thing that happened. One day I picked up the Washington, the Denver Post. And on the front page, there was a story about a guy named Timothy Redfern. And he's, he had gotten caught uh, breaking into houses. And he said to the police, you can't arrest me because I'm hired by the FBI to break into the Schroeder house. <laughs> so I put that together with my staff for a DU saying he was a little worried. And we said, we'd like to have a FOIA request. Well, it turned out the, the barber had been paid by the FBI. <laughs> yes, there was a guy paid. By, and it was hysterical because he was breaking into our house and getting campaign literature. And so you know, he had, she wins, we win, sounds like a communist, you know. Um, she wears those chicken shit pins, you know, the peace symbol. It, 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 I kept thinking, oh my God, federal dollars at work. They haven't got anything better to do. And they had a tap on the phone. And most of my phone calls were, mommy, she hit me. Oh no, he started it. You know, I think, okay, well, <laughs> here uh, we go. Thank you for coloring around the margins of that. I knew that was a little factoid. We have a bunch of other questions, and I know Larry wanted to go, but thank you for that. I, I just had to hear that because I think FOIA requests are probably one of the best tools we have, and I want my students to know, of course, that that's really a, a big part of what we do, and we have a lecture planned on that. But anyway, off to Larry. Great, thanks. Great. So you spoke about the uh, Australia model uh, requiring Google and others to pay for, uh, for news. You also talked about the demise of the fairness doctrine do you think that in this this era where you know hedge funds are the ones largely buying up newspapers, buying up and and destroying newspapers, is there a role for government today that you see beyond you know the Australia model? Beyond, I mean, maybe it's time to re-examine the fairness doctrine, or are there other solutions, or is this really the market should take care of uh, of things? I tell you, I am so depressed. I am hoping some of you very bright people will come up with better answers. I tried every year I was in there to redo the fairness doctrine because I felt so strongly about it. But you just can't because what would happen is every member would say, no, I can't do it because all the people on the TV stations and the radio stations in their districts came and said, no, 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 we don't want regulation. You know, regulation is a snarl word. And fairness doctrine became regulation, okay? Now, you may have seen that the prime minister of Australia not only said that, he also went on to say <laughs> that Murdoch was the worst immigrant that America 
could have taken because he's done exactly what he wanted to do in America, which is divide America. I, I didn't say that. The prime minister, I mean, I, I'm not the exact words. I shouldn't be saying something that's not the exact words. But nevertheless, that was the gist of what he was saying. That you people ought to wake up and realize what's going on, you know. Um, whether, you know, I watch public television and I've always supported public television, public radio, but even the Congress trying to get them to support it every year is a terrific problem, as you know. And how many hours do we have to listen to? <laughs> now, I personally send money to the, <laughs> to the Orlando Sentinel because it's all we've got. <laughs> The editor said one day, this is crazy. What are you doing? I said, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to subscribe and I'm going to send you more money because I want you to say, but I'm afraid we're going to lose it. It looks like it looks like it's going to be sold. Um, and, and we so desperately need it. I mean, just just what they were doing vis-a-vis -vis the governor and you know, trying to get his records. If we don't have anybody doing that, what's going to happen? I don't know. Uh, I'm hoping you and a think tank or something comes up with something better. But at the moment, um, I would love to see. I would love to see Congress try and do something like uh, um, a lot, or Australia or or I'd love to see public support. But I don't see how it's going to happen. Well, we're optimistic out here in Colorado. The, the Sun and others are trying to. Um, create and develop new business models. So uh, I'm, I'm an irrepressible optimist, so we can get this Thank done. You. Thank you. We need more of those and we <laughs> want it to work. I was delighted to hear about this. Song. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're doing that. That's great. Well, thank you. Well, I know we've got some student questions, so I'll uh, pass off to Len. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks to Larry, too, for taking the leadership in that, uh, as well as uh, members of the Colorado Media Project who are maybe on the call as well, uh, people who are really looking for these new business models for how we can have people who care about journalism continue to support it. And uh, and so we appreciate your advocacy for that. And I'm going to ask a question now that comes to us from Laura Reardon. And she says, you mentioned, and I agree, that young people don't know the three branches of government. I'd say, actually, many older people don't know the three branches of government as well. Um, but our electorate is uneducated, she says. And why do you think that this has happened? And then she also says, thank you for your public service that she has watched your career since the 80s. Oh, well, that's nice. Thank you. Um, I, I honestly worry that civics is hardly being taught anymore. Um, you know, we started all the testing and everybody starts teaching to the test and the test isn't about civics. Maybe we should be giving people the citizenship test. <laughs> most, most Americans who were born here could not pass the citizenship test because it does make you know something about how the government. Um, but no, I think it's just a tragedy that we don't have civics uh, in, in most of our public schools. We've totally failed. And I don't know how you expect the democracy to work if people don't know how it works, you know? So yeah, it, it's, it's very tragic. And many people have talked about it, but somehow it just doesn't happen. We just don't get it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Seth who has some questions from his students. Yes, uh, just a, a few more questions. Um, you had talked about some problems with uh, journalists not always um, holding uh, members of Congress accountable, not always reporting on their activities. Um, and obviously we're living through a period where like local coverage is on the decline. There's a lot of papers that have closed. I'm curious, do you think that, um, are there ways that, you know, in, given the constraints we have that we could incentivize better journalistic coverage of elected officials of, of Congress? Are, are, there, are there better ways that journalists can be holding members, uh, elected officials accountable? I wish I could think of some. Um, when I got elected, all, let's see, I think three or maybe four of the television stations had local people in DC. And both newspapers had people in DC. So there are about six local Denver people in DC 
covering not only me, but the whole congressional delegation. Now, I don't know what that's like now. I do know about Florida, which is zip. <laughs> Nobody. And, you know, they were there and, and you talk to them every day or your staff people talk to them every day. You told them what votes were on the floor. You told them what was going on, yada, yada, yada. And I think that's terribly important. Um, now, as I say, very few papers even print how they voted at the end of the week. You know, no one knows how anybody voted. Um, so it's just this giant vacuum right now. Um, I, I would hope we would get back to, you know, people having folks there live in person covering, <laughs> which makes a huge difference. Um, but I don't know. I think doesn't that's seem a, to be a, a somewhat related question. You had talked about um, uh, Representative Matt Gates and uh, you know part of his rise um, is has been his his ability to use Fox News and to get a lot of coverage and get a lot of attention um, simply by by saying a lot of bombastic things. Um, is it possible for you think someone to be a successful member of Congress um, without doing that pattern? I mean, is, is, is there another way toward, uh, you know, getting a position of power and, and using it without essentially going that route? You know, this whole dance of rage that's going on right now, it's like everybody's just supposed to be raging and mad at everything and everybody's trying to get you and you've got to, you know, uh, um, how we get people to lower their temperature and, and a part of it is because we're not teaching civics and people don't understand and I guess it's who entertains you the most or who you see the most on TV or what, I, I'm not sure how people are making their decisions. Um, and I think it's, it's so, so part of it's becoming incumbent upon citizens. Uh, who are angry, like myself, about this getting out there and saying to people, do you know? <laughs> For example, here there is a Progress Florida thing that, that gives you news every day that you don't get anywhere else. And I get a hold of neighbors and say, did you know? That? Oh, no, I never knew that. So it's really amazing, but it shouldn't be my job. But it's like, do I care enough? Yeah, I do. And, and I'm hoping um, I'm hoping that we can get back to journalists being able to do it because I'm getting old and tired and don't like to do that every day. <laughs> but it, 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 no, it's a real trouble. It's, you know, and you look at you look at TV, and what do they do? It's basically if it bleeds, it leads. You know, it's like where were the accidents today? What are, uh, there's very little about government usually. And, and talk radio was just, you know, one angry voice after another. Um, I don't know. I keep saying to my husband, I wanted to wear a t-shirt saying, I am not an angry white man. <laughs> I, I, for four years, I went down every day to the coffee shop and sat myself down with nine angry white men. Now they hated it that I came, but I just, I said, I really want to know what's going on in your head. You know, we live in the same little area. What, what do you see that's different that I'm not seeing? Why are you so mad? You know, um, and I, I never figured it out. To be honest, I will totally, I failed. <laughs> They're still angry and I still don't understand why. <laughs> I've one more question from a student asking about uh, just following up on your your comments about the the fairness doctrine and wondering if um, you know if instead of if since the media are not obligated to offer opposing sides time um, does the media actually sort of work against uh, the founders intentions for freedom of the press instead of work with it oh i think they do and i think they work for their pocketbook mm -hmm. um, they sell you time They'll sell you time during the election. They're not gonna cover the election. They're not gonna talk about the issues, but you can buy 30 seconds and go on. That's why you can't do it for $7.50 an average rate anymore. You, you can buy time and come on and, and tell them what it is. But, but the 
other thing is, is you're never going to tell anybody how you screwed up. You're going to tell everybody you were wonderful and it's terrific and you love puppy dogs and, you know, little kids and, you know, and hate taxes. And, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. And the guy who has the most money um, to get on the air the most, well, our, our former governor was a man, man named Scott. He made a ton of money um, in the healthcare business. They sued him because he did all sorts of illegal things. He had to pay the largest amount that's ever been paid and still ever been paid for Medicaid fraud from his, his business. He took the Fifth Amendment. So he brought that money down here and he bought everything. He did no interviews. He did not one interview with any newspaper vis-a-vis -vis editorials, not one in the whole state. But he was on the air and told everybody how wonderful he was. Heaven only knows how expensive it was. Let me tell you how much money he's taken over. And my last two years, a freshman came over and sat down next to me. And he said to me, can I ask you a personal question? I said, sure, what? He said, how do you spend your salary? <laughs> I said, well, I have two children in college. Oh, oh, he said, I didn't know you were one of those. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, how do you spend your salary? He said, I'm thinking about putting it in a flower fund. So I would have money for flowers for people for funerals or, you know, congrats. <laughs> <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> And if you look at it every year, the things are, there's more and more millionaires and billionaires, you know, and it's because of this doggone money thing. And it comes from this whole, uh, they own the press, you can't get on it unless you pay. So why would they cover, a, why would they cover you free? They're not gonna cover you free. If you pay, they cover. Yeah, that, that leads to a really good follow-up question that was raised by Nancy Gwynn, who actually was is the daughter of Ed Eslo, for whom this lecture is named. And she was asking about the role that campaign contributions play in the congressperson's vote and uh, whether the majority of constituents sometimes seem to be at odds, the interests of the majority of the constituents seem to be at odds with the money interests. Um, and I think we see this within Citizens United as well as other legislation. So I guess I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or any um, you know, models that you see that would be useful for us as we're thinking of different ways to approach uh, a representative government. Nancy, first of all, let me thank you and your family for sponsoring all of this. This is great. I am very honored. Yeah, I've given it a lot of thought. Um, uh, I think there should be limits on how much anyone can give. I don't think there should be dark money. I don't think corporations are people. Um, <laughs> the first time one has a, a colonoscopy, call me and I'll decide that they're a person, but I don't know of any corporations that have had a colonoscopy. One of the big problems I think with the disconnect is that when you have so much, and, and I really am, I'm so radical, I wouldn't have people take money from people out of their state. Um, if you represent Colorado, then why are you taking money from Pennsylvania or somewhere else? Because if you look at a lot of these places, they're getting more money from out of state than they're getting from their own state. So who are they going to be most happy about uh, or most interested in listening to? It's probably the people that gave money because they want to get money again. And what is happening now um, is that people spend most of their time over on the phone all day long making money or raising money. Their, their campaign coordinator says, today you have to raise 50,000 and if you don't, tomorrow you're gonna have to raise 100. And when you call people and say, uh, I need to raise this money, they're not saying, well, that's wonderful. Usually they're saying, yeah, and I don't like this, blah, 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 blah. you know, if this, then this. Uh, because you're talking big money. And I really think you've got to limit the amount of money. Um, and I, I would limit it to the state too. And do away with the dark and the corporation. I don't think corporations should be involved in it. I don't, 
you know, when they say, oh yeah, but it's for all the people in the corporate. Yeah, well, if the boss tells everybody to give money to X, how open and free is that? You know, I mean, so it, it, I think it, there's lots that could be done there. Thank you for that. And actually another one of Ed's daughters has also asked a question. Susan Lyde uh, wondered about how that might relate to term limits. And do you think that Congress would be willing to entertain term limits? Oh, thank you. And also thank you for your good family too. <laughs> um, coming from Colorado, I, when, when I represented from Colorado and I haven't really thought about it from Florida, I was against current term limits and I'll tell you why. Because if you take a state like Texas or California and um, Florida, they could control everything. Um, what one of the main things that Congress does is write formulas, let's say for roads, for education, for whatever it is, which state gets how much money. Um, and because they have so many members of Congress, <laughs> when they sit down to write it, it could be funny how tech, in fact, Texas is pretty good at doing this anyway. Uh, suddenly all the money is going to Texas. Um, and the one way you can kind of control that is if people from smaller states like Colorado uh, become chairman of committees, then they can say, no, 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 we can't do that. We're not gonna do that. That's the main reason I always thought that term limits were there. Now I must say there's term limits and then there's age. And I, I'm gonna confess right now, I'm an ageist. I really think they're all too old, that we should have young people there. I think it's a young person's game and if you do it right, you're working day and night. And um, I, I know a lot of people that are still there that were there when I was and I, I know what happens. You go to them with an issue and they say, oh, we did that once, you know, we'll try it again. You know, maybe we can do it this time. I mean. Uh, so it's it's also the age thing, uh, Susan, that I'm I look at too. I I look at all the octogenarians there, and being one, <laughs> I can say, okay, I have a lot of energy, but not as much energy as I had when I was forty and fifty, and I will admit it. And I don't think they do either. So uh, we'll see. What I, I don't think they'll ever do it because they don't want to limit themselves. I, I lost a good friend. Um, I like Diane Feinstein very much. She came to Congress. We got to know each other. Blah, blah, blah. She called me and said she filed for Senate. I said, you've got to be crazy. You'll be in your 90s. Are you absolutely out of your mind? California is full of young people. What are you doing? And then, oh, you're at ageism. I can't believe you're an age. And I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, so there you go. Well, we, I appreciate you encouraging young people to go into politics at the same time. And so I, I really think that's an important message for our students and others to hear. And I'm going to give our last question to Larry Rickman. Um, so let's turn it over to you, Larry. Thanks. Representative Schroeder, you entered Washington at what a lot of us look back on now as a sort of a golden age of uh, of American journalism, you know, Woodward and Bernstein, and you know, mm -hmm. you referenced the Pentagon Papers and all of that. And, you know, obviously, a, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. And we can look back now and see how much we've lost. You referenced the uh, how the Denver newspapers used to have correspondence and the and the local uh, TV stations had correspondence in Washington, all that's gone now. And looking back, is there anything you know, that that we collectively or Congress could have done differently to have headed off this place where we're at today. I mean, some people have talked about how we need to have greater media literacy taught in schools, but are, are, is there anything that you can suggest that, you know, looking back, if we'd only done, you know, X, Y, Z, is there something that we might've done differently? I don't know. You're so right. I mean, I used to get up and run to get my Washington Post during impeachment because you couldn't wait to find out what was going to happen next. You know, those are very exciting days. And the Pentagon Papers and so forth. Um, I do think it's the multiple media 
new media thing where everybody thought they could get it free online and quick and and nobody wants to spend more than 30 seconds on anything. And so why would you read? Um, and I, I, I don't know exactly where it was that we lost it, but we lost it in there somewhere. And it's uh, trying to figure out how we get it back. I don't know. I, when, I was, <laughs> when I was with the book <laughs> publishers, I got a call one day from a man who was furious, absolutely furious. He said, People like you cause my son to get an F. And I said, why? Um, what, what? Well, we went online and we, he looked, he had to write a paper about, I can't even remember what it was now, about some um, founder or something. And he wrote about this stock company because that's what he found. <laughs> that's what he found online. And it's like, we were to blame for the peer review online. You know, at, I was like, sir, I don't even understand what you're saying. And he's saying, well, you shouldn't allow stuff like that to be on there that isn't true. And I said, it is true. They are that, but your teacher's asking about something. We were not communicating at all. Obviously, it was another angry white man that I had never got through to. But um, people expect that all to be vetted and peer reviewed, and it isn't. And I don't think we've done a very good job of telling them, look, you're reading garbage half the time. And we know there's a lot of garbage out there, but the garbage sometimes is more exciting. <clears throat> and we've seen research showing that negative stuff is much more fun to read than positive stuff. You know, I, I don't know why, but people like to do that and they like to spread the, uh, this QAnon stuff and all this stuff. Where is this coming from? And yet it's serious. I mean, people really do believe it. I've had coffee with them at coffee shops and they're telling me that I am out of it. So I'm probably out of it, but not there, I don't think. <laughs> so I wish I had an answer for you, but I'm hoping you find one. And I'm glad to know that the Colorado Slum is alive and well and doing things. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And just a reminder to everyone, we're going to, um, continue our conversation at two o'clock uh, with Representative Schroeder over at the Colorado Sun. You can go to coloradosun.com slash live um, for a, a free sign up and uh, Seth Maskett and I will continue our conversation after giving the representative a much needed break uh, at some point. So I'll turn things back over to Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. I wanted to thank all my panelists as well as Representative Schroeder for being with us today. This has been a really wonderful conversation and such a rare opportunity for our students to be able to hear from you, Representative Schroeder. So thank you very much for that. You've always been an inspiration to me and I think to so many other people. And I want to thank my panelists as well for being such wonderful speakers and representatives of the student voices and, and such wonderful educators as well. And thank you also to uh, Emily Schwartz and uh, to uh, Ethan Crawford, who have been working on this event behind the scenes. And I also, again, want to extend my thanks to the Eslo family members who are here with us and who are interested in trying to continue to forward their father's legacy and his care for public good and for the importance of bringing together these kinds of conversations. So thank you, Representative Schroeder. And we will be sending you uh, your award. Usually it's a joy to be able to present that in person, but we will be mailing it to you in Florida and so that you'll be able to put it on yourself um, and hopefully remember us and, uh, and, and we as we will be remembering our time with you. So thanks again, everyone, and hope to see you all at two o'clock when the Colorado Sun reconvenes us.